Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. OK, so let's start. First, let me present myself. So I'm Slovan Stojanovic, and I'm CTO of Cloud Horizon. And also, I'm organizing JavaScript meetups in Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, and there are some blog posts on this website. But before we continue, I would like to know something about you. So I have a few questions. And obviously, the first question is, did anyone of you ever visited Mars? <laughs> no? <laughs> There's two. Cool. Is Elon Musk in the audience? No? OK, cool. So I guess I'm the expert today. So <laughs> <laughs> let's start. So first, a warning. Uh, of, obviously, this talk is more for, for fun, and I'm completely aware that some things will not work exactly as described on Mars one day. But yeah, let's have some fun. And let's try to answer most uh, the first question and most important question first. And uh, it's not that. It's why Mars? Why would anyone <laughs> build anything for Mars? So let's see something about Mars. What do we know about Mars? Well, we know it's a planet, that's obvious. And it has approximately the same land mass uh, with Earth because there's no oceans there. So it's almost the same uh, like land mass of Earth. It's just 10% of mass of Earth, but uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, then day is a bit longer, but almost the same. So you can sleep 40 minutes longer than on Earth. <laughs> that's not that bad. Then year on Mars is a bit longer, so almost twice as long as year on the Earth, which is, again, not that bad because, I don't know, you don't need to do taxis and things like that often. <laughs> that often. And if you're Santa, uh, Santa Claus, you, you have a bit longer vacation, so it's not that bad. Also, temperature on Mars can be really nice, it can be around 20 degrees. And uh, gravity on uh, Mars is just 37% of gravity on Earth. So you can basically jump from second flo uh, floor or something like that on the street without waiting for elevator or something like that. Not that bad at all. And also, there are signs of liquid water on Mars because we need water. Uh, that's great. It's not only this. There's other cool things about Mars. For example, uh, biggest mountain in the uh, solar system is on Mars. And it has two moons, so just imagine how nice is the sky in the night or something like that. But is everything about Mars that nice and perfect? It's not. So just 18 of uh, more than uh, four, uh, 40 uh, missions were successful so far. And that's something that we can work with. It will be better and better, of course. But you remember that nice temperature? It's not always like that. Sometimes it can be <laughs> minus 153 degrees, which is not that nice. It's almost like Canada. <laughs> but that's not your biggest problem there, <laughs> because uh, Mars has some of the largest dust storms in the solar system. But again, that's not your biggest problem on Mars. Uh, there's radiation, so you'll probably not survive enough <laughs> to feel those uh, uh, sorry dust storms. And again, that's not the biggest problem you have, <laughs> because there's no atmosphere, so you'll probably not survive enough to, for radiation. So why would anyone do anything for Mars? And why would anyone go to Mars? Because Earth sound, sounds like a really nice place. We have oceans, water, oxygen, and things like that. And Earth is really perfect, but maybe not that perfect if you ask dinosaurs. Because from time to time in our history, uh, actually on Earth's history, there was some mass extinction uh, events wh where we lost a lot of uh, different species, almost all of them sometimes, like 90 to 95%. And we know dinosaurs, and that's just, just 75%. And that's <coughs> happening from time to time. So we are in the engineers, and we know if something can fail, basically we need the failover, right? <laughs> so <laughs> if we, as human race, want to survive, we need to have a backup somewhere <laughs> in some other data center or availability zone. And yeah, so where can we go? Moon is really not the solution because uh, there's no water on moon and it really depends on Earth. So if something really bad happens to Earth, it will probably affect the moon too. Uh, if we go to other planets in solar system, it's 
it's again not that great. For example, if you go to Mercury, it's close to sun and it's really hot. There's no atmosphere, so it's, it's really not a nice place to be. But if you go to Venus, it's not much better. There is atmosphere, but it's too thick, so you're not able to survive. And there is some place of Venus that is really nice, and it's like 50 kilometers uh, above the <coughs> surface, and we're not really good at building some floating cities and things like that. Then we have Mars, and all the other planets after Mars are too far away and too cold. So, yeah, that's basically our only close option. So, now just imagine that you have some website, and you know those magic tricks when you need to, uh, to uh, see some card and just remember that card. So remember that, we'll come back to that. And let's go to Mars. So, another cool thing about Mars is that it is the only planet uh, <laughs> inhabited by robots only. <laughs> Maybe this guy would not. <laughs> Until one day, in future, maybe in 10 years or so, this guy <laughs> creates some big rocket <laughs> and then put some people in that rocket and then push them in space. After some time, this module uh, will detach the, the main part of the rocket. That other part will land back to the Earth. And then, that module with some people inside will head to Mars. After some time, a few months, they will be close to Red Planet. And then we'll all watch and tweet about that, <coughs> and uh, they'll finally land there. And of course, after some time, they will build some Martian city or something like that. So that happened. That will happen eventually. And when we inhabit Mars, uh, we'll need some things, and like, who knows what's, what this is. <laughs> so, when we come to Mars, we'll need some things. First, of course, we'll need something to breathe, food and things like that. Then we'll work on safety and other things that we need. But there's one more thing that we really need, and that's, of course, Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> so, eventually, on Mars, we'll have internet. <laughs> And you remember that you have that website, and one day uh, you're handling customer support, and you receive a message that your website is not working. So you can ask, hey, which browser do you use? And then you'll receive an answer that is a bit uncommon, and it's like Chrome, some huge version on some space modulator or whatever. And, of course, <laughs> you don't know how to handle that. So, what's the problem? why your, your website is not working on Mars. What? You, you start reading everything on the internet, and uh, yeah, the first thing you see is the distance, because uh, light travels three to 22 minutes between Earth and Mars. And sometimes uh, when sun is in between the planets, you're not even able to communicate with Mars. So our age distance is like 12 minutes, 12, uh, almost 13 minutes. And uh, if they're on opposite sides, you need 22 minutes, which means if you have HTTP request, it will take, what, 44 minutes or so? And that's for light. So, yeah, you have latency. <laughs> and how do you solve latency? Of course, you can try to deploy to <laughs> Mars <laughs> West 1, but uh, AWS is still building their data center <laughs> on Mars, so you need to find a better solution. And then you, you want to see how do you communicate uh, generally in space. So, because you're not able to, uh, to do HTTP requests and things like that, of course, Matt Damon will be sad because there's no Netflix or anything real time. It takes too much time. So, you don't have servers, so what, what can you do? Maybe go serverless? Mm -hmm. well, Unfortunately, it will not work on Mars yet. <laughs> so, you need to think how to solve that. And of course, as I said, you want to see how, how do you communicate uh, in space and what can you use to communicate in space. Basically, it's not much different than this. It's radio waves. 
It's the same radio that you're using in your car or whatever. So basically, we're sending messages as radio waves, and uh, each spacecraft uh, have some uh, kind of uh, emitter, and then uh, NASA has uh, large uh, receivers on Earth, and that's it. It's a bit slow, and you can send just a small bits of data, but yeah, it's not that perfect, but it works so far. Also, there's another thing called interplanetary internet, and basically it's not really internet that we know today. It's more a network of networks. And we have some, um, it's built to, to work on, um, sorry, in a very uh, high latency and instable uh, places like space, of course, or for example, on North Pole or something like that on Earth where we don't have infrastructure. And uh, it's based on delay or disruption uh, tolerant networking. As I said, uh, it's planned to work on in space, and let's see the difference between standard internet and uh, delayed tolerant networks. First, with standard internet, uh, we're sending packages and receiving some uh, feedback all the time, and that works. If something fails, we can just resend the package. But uh, with uh, interplanetary internet, it works a bit differently. So we have many nodes. Those nodes can be, for example, satellites or some old spacecraft or who knows what. And the difference is that it's not just sending the data from one place to another. You need to store all those data because if something fails, like here, you don't want to send everything from Mars again. So it's like whenever you receive some data, you need to store it and then to send it to the next node. Of course, that will limit a bit the uh, amount of data that we can store on Mars. And eventually, there will be some servers on Mars, of course, but NASA will use them for some there are things, but let's go back to web development. And let's try to solve the problem with websites that will eventually work on Mars. So what's the first obvious thing that you can do? It's offline access. So if we have some servers, and eventually NASA will, uh, or whoever else, Elon Musk, whoever, will have some servers on, uh, in, the, uh, on the, in Mars, uh, but they will use those servers and everything uh, for their communication, but eventually they will allow us to transfer some things and things like that. So first thing that we can do is to use service workers that are basically a proxies between your browser and the uh, network and uh, actually your application browser and network. Uh, so basically whenever we have something, we should just store it offline and uh, be sure that uh, second time someone visits your website, uh, that person can just load everything uh, from local first. And with service workers, there are things that... Uh, um, so first, service workers is, uh, are allowing us to have offline experiences. Uh, it allows us to intercept network requests and uh, do some actions, which is great. Uh, then uh, we can even do some kind of push notifications, which can be really useful if you're waiting for some information that will that is loading uh, from Earth or something like that. And also there are some background things, APIs. So you don't even need your browser uh, active at that moment. It can do some things in the background. And you can use them today. It's not that hard to, to start working with service workers. You should try. Basically, uh, you need to check if uh, service workers are supported in your browser because some of the browsers are not supporting them yet. And then you can tell the browser what do you want to cache and uh, store those things uh, into cache. Uh, so that's the first thing, but then you, you still have a problem. Most of the websites are talking to a server all the time and you want to lower the, the amount of uh, requests and things like that. And in the previous talk, we heard about GraphQL and that's a tool that can help us to, to just reduce the number of uh, of API calls that you are making. So basically, uh, GraphQL is a query, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, with GraphQL, we are, we are sending query with specified uh, data that we want, and then backend will return us uh, the data that we need. And that's useful because on, for example, one page, we can just load everything that we need for that page, not just uh, users, then maybe posts and things like that. So that can help a bit. And also, again, let's go back to the offline storage. Whenever we receive some data, we want to store that data locally. 
And happily, there is database that can work locally, and it's called IndexedDB. It's a low-level API for client-side uh, storage, and uh, of course, it's using indexes, and uh, it's allowing us to have some high-performance uh, searches and things like that. So basically, let's see that database. It's something special. It's just a key-value pairs. Uh, it's built on trans transactional database model. It's mostly asynchronous. Uh, it uses DOM events to notify us uh, that some results are available. It's no SQL database, and of course you need to, to take care about same origin policy. We'll not see the code because the API is low level and a bit horrible, but uh, fortunately we have some other implementations uh, which are built on top of uh, IndexedDB and some other solutions that we can use. So for example, we can use thing called PouchDB, which uh, is uh, local database implementation of CouchDB, which uh, just allows us to have a local database, and whenever we store something in that local database, it will be automatically synced to the, some CouchDB or some other databases uh, on the internet. And uh, yeah, it's really easy to, to get started with it. Uh, if you go to PouchDB website and open uh, DevTools, you'll be able to interact with their uh, database, but uh, basically you can create a new database, put some things in it, and then just uh, tell browser to replicate that to some, uh, to some external server. And uh, that will handle the data storage and things like that. And let's go back one more time to background sync. We just mentioned that, but uh, we can do more things with that. So with background sync, basically we, we can tell website to uh, call the, uh, sorry. With background sync, uh, we can just uh, synchronize with, uh, with our server even with, with, uh, when our website is uh, not loaded in the browser. And again, that's something that works in some browsers and it's not that hard to use. You can use it from service worker. But if we can do that, uh, why wouldn't uh, we do that with something more important like downloading and uploading because just imagine that you want to send a photo to your family or something like that from Mars. <coughs> it will take ages to upload that somewhere. So there is another thing that we can use, uh, actually not yet because it's just the draft, but eventually uh, in the next 10 years it will be in the browser. So basically we can use background fetch that can upload the, or, or Delegate uh, upload and download to uh, your operating system and then just notify you when something is done. So instead of having browser, you can upload the, the image via browser, then close your browser, and then your operating system in the background will just open something or something like that. You can also use a browser to indicate the progress and things like that. Uh, and of course, to react to some failures and things like that. So. That's less interesting things, but how do we communicate uh, if we don't have enough servers and things like that? And obvious answer is with peer-to-peer -peer connections. So how can we use peer-to-peer -peer connections in the browser? Uh, you can do that via WebRTC, which allows us to, it's a, sorry, it's a free and open source project that uh, allows us to, to talk between browsers without using the uh, the server, and there are uh, three things that we can use uh, from WebRTC. It's media stream, so we can just capture the camera and things like that. It's RTC peer connection, so we can uh, check how many people are connected and think, uh, handle that. And the, probably the most important part for us is data channel that allows us to send some binary data or any other part of data through uh, WebRTC. And it's a bit uh, messy when you uh, take a look here, but uh, basically it's not that hard to use it. And the good thing with WebRTC is that allowed us to, to build some more cool things like WebTorrent, uh, which is a torrent implementation that works completely in the browser. So it's written completely in JavaScript, and you can uh, sync or download torrents or do anything you want from, for example, Chrome browser, which is really cool. And it's really cool because that allows us to build the peer-to-peer job, uh, YouTube or something like that, where you don't need to host your video on some server or something like that. Basically, you can use your browser to 
uh, store your video, actually your computers to store your video and other people can connect you to your device by peer-to-peer uh, -peer connection. And then, of course, uh, to, uh, they can download the video and things like that. So, um, using WebTorrent is, again, not that hard. I'll uh, put the uh, slides online, so that's why I will not explain all the codes and everything, but it's basically really easy. You just need to create new WebTorrent connection, add some magnet link, and then do whatever you want uh, with it. For example, you can append it to body and play the video out of the box. But when we have WebTorrent and we have files in the browser, what's, why wouldn't we be able to just load HTML, CSS, and JavaScript directly through peer-to-peer -peer connection? So that will allow us to build websites that are fully distributed and not stored on some server or something like that. And of course, that's even uh, possible even today. And you can do that with Hyperdrive which is a file sharing network based on uh, actually chunking and uh, it's based on append-only logs and it's using Merkle trees for that. And it's really cool because uh, it's, uh, it's able to split your file into chunks and then it's uh, hashing all the chunk, uh, chunks and then you have easy way to verify if that, that file is uh, valid or not, so you can even check if someone uh, that you trust uploaded the file or not. And uh, <coughs> technically, you should be able to, to change some parts of the file without regenerating. For example, with WebTorrent, if you change uh, just one part of your video file, like, uh, I don't know, adding or removing one frame, that will result in a new torrent file. But with this, you can change things and have the same uh, um, so algorithm is smart enough to see that just small bits are changed and you can probably transfer just those bits uh, through the network and sync. And uh, Hyperdrive is basically a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, data distribution protocol that powers that. Uh, and it consists of two ma uh, major parts and many other small libraries. So uh, there is Hypercore uh, that is handling uh, the core protocol for peer-to-peer uh, -peer data and uh, append-only logs and things like that. And also the second part is that hyperdrive that uh, allow you to, to uh, connect to your uh, to file system and things like that and to store that data or upload the data from your uh, computer. And if you want to use something out of the box, you can use that. You can go to that-data.com, uh, and they even have a web application that, uh, oh, sorry, a uh, native application that you can just install and share the data. Uh, so you'll get some uh, URL-like URL thing that you can send to someone, and uh, people can just synchronize uh, with your existing uh, files and things like that. Uh, there's other thing called interplanetary file system, which is a bit different. It's a basically, uh, basically a set of protocols, but uh, it's uh, fully distributed, and again, you can sync just parts of the data and things like that. And um, you can, uh, both of those things are really nice, but of course, they're not working out of the box in, uh, in the current browsers, but there is some browsers like Beaker Browser that allows you just to put the, that link in the URL bar, and then you'll be able to load the website that is not hosted on some server, but on some peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, some, uh, some node that is connected via peer-to-peer -peer network. And uh, that browser also allows you to do one more thing that is not, uh, that you're not able to do with Chrome, and that's to create a new site. So it will just create a folder on your laptop or uh, wherever, and then allow you to just start uh, sharing that with other people. So without, uh, buying the, it's basically a serverless uh, in a different way, <laughs> probably a true serverless. And yeah, that's all just part of our problems, not everything. Uh, on Mars, we'll have a few other problems that are far beyond this talk. And for example, we'll have problems with timestamps and things like that because most of the time we are, uh, we are using time, uh, data and things like that from Earth, but uh, who knows how will that work when we have multiple planets with different uh, duration of the day and things like that. Then also, if you want to store and check the session and your main server is on Earth, so for example, if you want to log into your Facebook account, who knows how that will work, we'll have probably a separate Facebook for Mars or something like that. 
Uh, security and privacy. Uh, in the beginning, that will not be a big problem, probably, but eventually that can become a big problem. Also, how do we test for extreme situations? How, do, uh, how can you just, uh, I don't know, uh, write unit tests or in actual integration tests that will simulate a uh, huge delay and uh, delay tolerant networks and everything? So that, that, those are some of the problems that we'll need to solve in the next 10 years or so. And let's go to a message of this uh, talk. So the message is that we can build Instagram for Matt Damon, right? Not really. So th the main message of this talk is that uh, most of the things that we're building today are not really working for everyone even here on this earth, on this planet. And eventually in like 10 years or 20 years, we'll need to scale everything to multi-planet system. But if you go to Southeast Asia or some other places on Earth, it will be really hard to, to use some of the websites that we are building. So sometimes it's really easy for us to change just a few things and make all those websites and everything that we're working on more accessible for, for people on Earth. And then eventually we'll be able to improve that and allow people on other planets to, or maybe in space, uh, International Space Station to use the websites and everything. And that's basically it, but I have one more thing. So, Cristiano mentioned uh, my new book, and uh, there's a code for 40% uh, discount, and whoever asks the first question will get one book if you want the book. <laughs> no. Can I have yeah. the book? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question, but it's... <laughs> and that's all, basically. Thank you. He's already rising good. <laughs> Is there like an interplanetary um, time zone standard? Not yet, <laughs> as far as I know. Because that's going to be fun. Um, yeah, it's... I, uh, <laughs> how, how does daylight saving works in <laughs> Earth and Mars? <laughs> it's like... You have to scale up to daylight saving, right? Hmm? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, no. Uh, do you want the book? Yeah. Do you want the book? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me know after the talk. <laughs> so next question. <laughs> I, I love how you think time zones are fun now. <laughs> I, they're really not. <laughs> yeah. Just imagine leap second in an interplanetary <laughs> system. <laughs> okay. So. You know when you said transferring data and the, the packets, where exactly are they stored? So basically, each router or whatever, uh, for example, maybe old spacecraft or something like that can be transferred, uh, converted to, to that uh, node. So basically, that node needs to be able to store the packages and then to resend them to the to next node. Uh, basically, a router is not just the router that is sending packages anymore. It's storing them and sending. I've, we'll see how that will work <laughs> in practice. So next question, sorry. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you have the same problem as any other distributed network, so uh, it, will, uh, it will have eventual consistency. Not, uh, it will not be propagated everywhere immediately, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not the easy problem to solve, but for now, for example, uh, that is working. Uh, is just trying to sync, uh, connecting to peers and sync with all the peers. So if some peer is offline and uh, have new data, obviously you will not have the latest data of the website. Basically, we will have multiple versions of everything, but that's something that we need to think about. So no quick fixes in production and things like that. <laughs> Any other? Has Amazon said anything about this? Did they try <laughs> to do things or oh, have any knowledge of it? Yeah, it's... Uh, so did I try to? Uh, no? Amazon. Oh, Amazon. Uh, so no, no, of course, not, of course not. Okay. <laughs> as far as I know, no, because there's nothing on Mars, of course. <laughs> and <laughs> eventually, uh, when we have people on on Mars, uh, I'm sure that Amazon will have something on Mars <laughs> because they need to sell you something. Probably Prime will not work immediately, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next year delivery. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, no. Yeah, you need to wait like uh, two or three years because. Uh, Planets are not uh, going the uh, so 
each two years or so, planets are close one to another, so you can travel for three months or so, but most of the time they're not really close, so. Yeah, but they'll have localized distribution centers. Probably, <laughs> probably. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they'll have something. <laughs> I think that's it, right? Yeah, I think Okay, we're done. thank you very much. <laughs>